Thank you, Brad. Sorry. Ah, forgot I'm mic'd. I don't need that mic. Okay. But I do need this. Good morning, everybody. It's really awesome to be in Portland. Uh, I was just realizing as I was chatting with one of my seatmates down here that uh, last time I was here was 22 years ago when I left Reed College. Um, and it's been a really long time, and it's a wonderful, beautiful city. It's great to be here. So today, I'm going to talk about libraries. But I'm going to start by, um, I think I'm going to start by telling you about myself very quickly. I was born here. This is Quito, Ecuador, uh, in the 70s. And uh, when I was five, my family moved us to LA. And back in the 70s, in the late 70s, this distance, these few thousand miles, were like going to a different universe. Um, we were writing letters to our family at home in Quito on paper, hoping they would arrive. Sometimes they would take four weeks or six weeks to arrive. Sometimes they would never arrive. We would make very special occasion long distance calls because they were so expensive. And it sounded like that. And you had to scream literally into the phone to be heard. Um, and it was like being from, for me, growing up in LA, I felt like, OK, I'm in LA. I live here. But I'm from Mars, right? Like, I'm from a completely different universe. And it's just that little tidbit um, about me that I think helps lead us to where we are today. So uh, I think because of that, I was always in this funny, um, had this funny sense that I was straddling two worlds or was carrying insights about one world into another world. And I think like many immigrant kids, right, grew up a little bit as a translator, both literally and, and, and kind of figuratively for my family and for others uh, about how different parts of the world were, because I felt like I had these interesting views into both. Um, and I think throughout my work life, I've been drawn to situations like that, where there are these disparate ways of solving problems, and there's no real clear path to a solution. There's something interesting to be done or to be resolved. And let's try to figure it out and build the path. So why libraries? Um, in many ways, you know, that's why libraries for me. Um, because they feel today, and I hope I'll give you some, some color to this, like places, um, like institutions, where many different uh, points of view, because we serve everybody, can be brought to bear to work on community issues, community needs, um, and to really um, sort of create these, these third places, these interesting places that bring together a lot of different ideas. So the quick news about libraries, if you haven't been keeping up, is that according to Pew, uh, people still love libraries. Uh, they still use libraries, and they think that they're important. Um, people think that, you know, libraries are important to literacy and reading, um, and that they really believe still, most Americans, that libraries overwhelmingly um, have an important role uh, in communities and in a person's uh, ability to develop. So that's the good news and news to some people who think like, wow, in the digital age, libraries are going to be gone soon. Um, this is just a tongue in cheek, you know, how do people feel about libraries compared to all of these other organizations? <laughs> they like libraries better than apple pie. Um, so uh, all of that really to say that the, the starting point for libraries um, that has been hard earned, I would say, as someone who's not a librarian and now works among librarians and really admires them, uh, it's, a, it's a hard earned uh, trust, public trust, that libraries have established and that allows libraries uniquely to um, work with communities to tackle some, you know, some big issues and to take advantage of opportunities to, to support learning and to you know, support economic advancement in some communities, to really promote cultural awareness in other communities. So really, depending on what's going on in your local context, libraries are really well placed to help tackle that problem. Um, Chicago. This is the map of the city of Chicago. All those little white dots are the 80 libraries that we have across the city. So if you know Chicago, you know Chicago is what's called a city of neighborhoods. Uh, and it just means everybody sort of lives in their own little neighborhood bubble and hangs out in their own little neighborhood bubble. And it's, 
important to us as a library system in Chicago that we're accessible in every community, and we, we really are. Uh, a million is about the number of unique visitors that we get to our website um, at Chicago Public Library every month, people downloading media, people you know, posting now. We have a pretty cool website where you can post reviews and sort of keep lists and share other people's lists and read other people's reviews and, and do all kinds of things, put stuff on your shelf, keep track of what you've read, keep track of what you want to read download ebooks, we have phone apps, all of this. So that's about how many unique visitors we get monthly to our new site. Three million is um, the number of public computer sessions that we hosted in these 80 locations last year. So we have about 3,000 public access computers. For many people in the city of Chicago, the library is the only place where they can use a computer, uh, get online, email, etc. Um, and, and we hosted about three million such sessions last year, and an equal number, although this number is growing much more rapidly than the first, of Wi-Fi sessions. So we offer free Wi-Fi in every one of these buildings, and about three million times folks took advantage of that service last year in Chicago. And uh, 10 million is about how many people walked through our doors last year across of these locations. So again, Chicago, like national trends, people use libraries. What we've decided in Chicago that we're really focused on doing, um, I think like most other libraries, is, is supporting people in learning no matter what stage they're at in their life. That includes this really fun stuff that we get to do with tiny ones, the zero to five population, for whom um, you know, research says that the way that they learn, that their brain develops and that they get ready for preschool is that if adults who love them and care for them, are talking with them, are singing with them, are reading to them, are writing with them once they get a little bit older, and are playing with them. So we've really been working on transforming our library children's spaces into these activity centers where we encourage through librarians who are professionally trained to help promote these kinds of activities and make them feel unintimidated. I don't know how many of you have um, talked to a one-year-old before or spent much time talking to a one-year-old. It can feel kind of silly, right? Because you're like, I don't really know that they understand what I'm saying, or a six-month-old. Um, but what, you know, what, we're, what we're able to do in libraries um, and that librarians are really uniquely skilled to do is break down all of this complex brain research and say, really, all you need to do is think of things that you can talk to your little one about textures, colors, describe the world around you, and get um, people with young kids and caregivers comfortable doing these things. So we've really been working on transforming these, these spaces and the materials that we use and the outreach that librarians do to early learning centers to help promote these activities. They're really simple and they're evidence-based. They lead to better outcomes for little people. Another thing that we've really taken on in Chicago is this notion that um, fostering creativity and curiosity about learning um, can be done really and needs to be done for everyone. Um, you know, you're probably all tired of hearing this thing about we need more STEM, we need more STEM. We actually agree we need more STEM. We've put in the word A for arts, so this you know, science, technology, engineering, arts, and math approach to learning that really, when you get down to the core of it, it's about curiosity <laughs> and problem solving and tinkering and failing and learning from your failures. It's about all the things that we know uh, as adults we need to know how to do no matter what field we go into. Um, and it really is about creativity. So we take very seriously our role as a place that, that focuses on access to everyone. So if this kind of learning is what's important for the future of our country, for the future of our communities. We know that it needs to be accessible and available to every single person in our communities. Um, so the way that we've tackled this is just some very simple things. Uh, every summer, most libraries around the country have always done something called a summer reading campaign. Two years ago, this will be the third year in Chicago, we've changed it up and we've made it a STEAM learning challenge so that although we're still promoting reading by encouraging kids and families to read all the time, we're also partnering up. This is an example of one of the um, 
really easy curricula that's designed by the Museum of Science and Industry in Chicago, really a world-class museum that designs science education that's accessible for kids, but doesn't have the reach that the library does. So think about you know, taking this really high quality material and resources, and rather than just having it available to kids who visit the museum, having it available to all kids throughout the city. So last year, 83,000 kids in Chicago did a science project, um, or more than one, related to our summer learning campaign. They um, read uh, at least 300 minutes of reading uh, throughout the course of the summer to keep people engaged. And it's a way for libraries to support learning in really fun ways. Nobody has to come to the library, right? Nobody's signed up. We don't take attendance. If it's not fun, people don't show up. Um, so we, we do things like hire scientists to come in and do crazy explosion workshops in libraries. Last year, the theme for our uh, summer program was um, animals and the environment. So we had like giant snakes and reptiles in a bunch of neighborhood libraries that kids could touch and learn about. Um, and they were brought in by the zoos. So they were, you know, the folks who were talking about these animals were talking about it in a very responsible way. Um, the other thing we've done is this notion of, you know, science education for all often includes computer programming now, and that's like the big thing. So there's a, a little guy named a Finch robot. Have any of you ever seen this thing, this toy? It's uh, relatively new, uh, and it was developed by Carnegie Labs as a learning tool for computer programming. You hook this up to a computer, and you can go on the website and learn to code in everything from Snap, the really, really basic, to more advanced languages. And you basically train this little toy to go forward, go backwards, light up, make noises, turn colors, you know, all this kind of stuff. Um, and we got a donation from a local Google engineer of 500 of these guys last year, and we put them out um, into our branches for some, to support some activities, but then we put them out to loan uh, like a book. So you can check one of these out for three weeks, just like you would any book, return it. Um, and we have you know, all kinds of um, groups of kids, science teachers, and then just families checking these guys out and getting their hands on this really easy tool to begin to, um, introduce themselves to coding. For teenagers, we try to figure out a way to, to make this stuff accessible and interesting to them. So we have things like e-textiles classes in many of our libraries. We served about 4,000 teens last year in these kinds of hands-on making and learning. We have 3D printers in the, in the um, uh, libraries for the teens. And in the summer, you know, this, this cover is an example of like trying to make it more teen friendly. The, the, summer challenge, less cutesy, a little bit more edgy, making it look like an old magazine. Um, but we, we use things like little bits. We're always looking for new tools to introduce people to these science concepts that we think are really relevant for everybody. Um, and, and we've seen a huge uptake in this stuff by the general public. We don't leave out adults in this idea of STEAM for all. So this is a little bit of a blurry picture. I'm sorry, it's hard to see. But these are the Finch robots and a bunch of grown-ups using them in an obstacle course contest. So they were given instructions um, about how to program them. And they had to get through the course. And the first you know, robot wins. And it was teams of two. And we try to do these kinds of things to make learning playful, not just for small people, but also for adults all across the city of Chicago. Um, another thing that we started to take really seriously is, you know, we've been having this program called UMedia in the library for about five years now. And teens literally are coming and hanging out at the library every day after school as if it's a super cool thing to do because we have a lot of fun activities for them. We let them just hang out and chat if they want. We let them bring food into the library, which is apparently a really big deal. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> They do their homework or whatever, but they also engage in things like video design. Um, they, they do podcasts. We have sound studios in many of our libraries for teens to use. They do music production. We have mentors who come into the libraries after school and spend time helping teens understand, you know, if I'm really interested or passionate about music, go deep into music production, but also begin to understand the business of music so they can begin to think about what they might do after high school, make connections to internships and things like that. Um, 
We've now opened more of these spaces across the city of Chicago after having had a lot of success with just one. Um, but we realize, you know, these teens are coming, they're coming every day, they trust the librarians, they trust the folks that they meet in the library, and we've begun to, to work harder to have, you know, working professionals in a variety of backgrounds come into the library and work hands-on with these teens as well as volunteers. So we've been doing these career Saturdays, and you'd think, you know, Saturday mornings, like how many teens are going to show up to a library on a Saturday morning? Um, they've been coming in pretty big groups to meet people who do. Um, the first one we had was about writing, careers in writing. So we had folks come in who work, uh, who, who write for a living, whether it's a marketing gig at uh, Groupon or it's an actual, you know, writer who publishes poetry or whether it's a journalist and um, allow these teens um, to see real live humans who are putting something that they think is very interesting to do as a hobby to use earning income. And we think this is a really important role that we can play. So kids, as I said, some of them are into computers, some of them are into photography, some of them are into the arts, some of them are into music. And we've been giving um, big chunks of our libraries over to teens <laughs> so that they can explore these interests in a way that you know, might lead to better post-secondary decision making. Some examples of like cool stuff that happens as a result, um, this young man, Philip Brooks, he uh, designed a t-shirt uh, as part of a competition from the Kennedy Center and now his t-shirt designs are for sale in the store at the Kennedy Center. Um, he got connected with folks from Burberry who are somehow very philanthropically interested in teens, who knew? Um, and they're thinking about ways to expose him to other you know, designers so that he can pursue a career. Um, and then this map, you'll see another version of a map of Chicago in a moment, and this map will be a little more meaningful to you then. This is a map of the city of Chicago. This is where most of these teens that I'm talking to you about come from. The west side and the south side is where primarily most of these kids live. And if you know Chicago, you know that the south and west sides of the city tend to be the areas with highest crime, highest unemployment, lowest educational attainment. These are kids who don't have a lot of adults in their neighborhood life um, that can help them design their own path, right, and develop their own future. So we feel like it's really our responsibility as a democratic institution to reach out to everybody and engage them in this kind of really awesome learning that is you know, available to folks who can afford it, typically. Um, another really important piece of our role that we've started in Chicago in particular to take very seriously is this notion of digital inclusion. And I'll start with the fun stuff. So we um, launched a, you know, an innovation lab in the library a couple of years ago, and it was really a place for us as a library system to test ideas about new services, possible future services, for the communities that we work with. You know, this notion that the, the digital age is here, the digital age will continue to, to shape the way that people access information and knowledge. We need to start playing with things that might lead us to, you know, what the future of the library looks like. The first project that we put in there was meant to be a six month experiment. And it was a makerspace. It had 3D printers, it had a CNC mill, it had vinyl cutters. And it was really for adults. We'd had all of these cool activities available to little kids and teens for years. And adults in Chicago were saying, well, what about us? So we focused on the adult population and we did a little bit of interviewing, a little research, a little design research, and we found that people were very curious about these technologies that two and a half years ago were still like incredibly new, you know, and many people hadn't seen. Um, and so we started offering classes. We offer two classes a day, typically. And we've, what we've done to make this really, really accessible, so we've, we've served in classes since we opened about a year and a half ago, probably close to 10,000 people. And 70% of those 10,000 people are women, which is totally flipped from most of the maker spaces, activities, fairs, et cetera, that we've seen um, in Chicago. The thing that we did is, again, go back to that focus on access for all, right? If everybody isn't welcomed, if everybody's not participating, we're missing out on a lot of brilliant people and their ideas and their contributions to this community space. 
So in order to make the space accessible, the team has been tinkering with a bunch of different approaches. And what we found is that what worked for us is this balance between digital making and crafting. And so in this space, we'll have you know, digital design of a 3D object class. And then the next class we have is origami or you know, flower arranging. And then what really is fun is when we combine the two. So we have these robotic knitting machines so you can knit with a robot, or you can do you know, e-textiles, you can design clothing or jewelry or whatever that lights up and learn circuitry. So it's this blending of all of these different approaches to learning that has, in our case, really opened the door to a much more diverse user group for this kind of activity. And we have a couple of classes a day, and then when we're not in class session, well, we, we have what we call open shop, which is when we invite people to come in um, and make whatever they want to make. We typically have another thing that we've done that, that you know, we've been lucky to be able to do is have it heavily facilitated. So this tiny little room, we normally have uh, about three library staff or, a, or volunteer and staff combination facilitating learning. So that no matter who comes in, we've had people come in and say, I've never used a computer before, but I really want to make this like pair of earrings for my girlfriend or whatever. And we have folks who are patient, <laughs> who are non-judgmental, who you know, help walk people through it. Um, we've decided to use uh, entirely um, open source software for a couple of reasons in the lab. One, it's free to us, which is great because we don't have a huge budget for this. This is kind of a side project. And two, people can use it at home, typically. Mostly web-based software is what we're using. And people can use the stuff at home and practice and learn you know, if, they, if they have computers or computer access at home. Um, and so it's, it's just been this way for us to say to folks in the community, you know, you're welcome to come in. As a result of this six month, it was supposed to be a six month experiment, um, demand was so high, we actually had a, um, uh, a local you know, company come in and say, we hear your lab is closing soon, is it for lack of funds? If so, we want to tell me how much it costs to keep it open. We want to keep it open another year. So we got Motorola Mobility, uh, a local company, to say, you know, we're going to give, we're going to underwrite, and it's not a hugely expensive operation, but it wouldn't, it doesn't fit within our regular operating budget to keep it open, and we've kept it open now for almost two years, um, and uh, it continues to be this place where we test new ideas. So every time some new tech tool comes out that looks like it might be applicable to learning in our context, this informal learning context, or it might be something we want to lend out, you know, we test it in here, we see how it goes, we see how people take to it. There's this new thing, and I, I'm kicking myself because I don't remember what it's called, but um, we just uh, also participated in this like demo day, this tech startup demo day in Chicago, and we were like, we were the customer, even though, you know, we don't have a ton of money, but these startups who do uh, their education technology or tools for learning pitched us, and one of them was this um, circuit pen, like you can write with ink and create circuits on paper, so you don't need any of the other stuff. It's very cool, and we've started to test it out here with a curriculum that was designed by this company to see if it's something that we might want to package up and lend out through the lending library, or um, something that we might want to incorporate in our classes for teens, et cetera. So it's still a really neat experimental space for us. Um, and it's m more importantly a place where people from really very different walks of life can come together and help each other. When we started the lab, we were wondering about, you know, are we stimulating creativity? Are we um, supporting collaboration and collaborative learning? And so we've been implementing this survey, you know, asking people what they did and what they made and all of that. And most of the people who respond to the survey, and this is thousands of surveys now over the last several, um, many, many months, say that while they're in there, either they're helping somebody else or they've gotten help in their work. Um, and typically it's a stranger. And so we just see a lot of really neat interaction, which we also think is a, a, an important role for libraries to play. Here's just one weird story about what happened in the lab. So um, I have like dozens of these, but this was the one with the coolest picture. So I thought I'd share this one. Um, so this uh, surgeon came in uh, from a local hospital system and said, um, do you think that we could 3D print an exact replica of one of my patient's skulls? 
uh, I have this, you know, these images, and like I don't know what to do with it. So one of our interns actually uh, <laughs> figured out how to, you know, upload the image, how to manipulate the image, and how to get it to print. And it turns out that this doctor um, performs surgery. He repairs uh, broken skulls. And in order to be able to get a graft of um, bone that is exactly the right dimension, he needs a, a you know, a, an exact replica, and then he can get the right kind of bone graft, and, and he can prep for the thing. So that's what he's been doing in our lab. Um, he did it a few times to prove that this was a much more uh, affordable and faster way. What he was doing before is sending those images out to a lab, and it would cost like $4,000 a pop to get these things done. In our lab, we, just char we charge for time on the printer. We used to charge for the amount of material you used, and then we found out the material was irrelevant, and it's like, how many hours does this take? And it's like $2 an hour or something that we charge. So what these things are costing him in our lab are like $32 um, to print. And he then wrote a grant proposal and now has a 3D printer in his um, in, the, in the hospital, but for a while, we were like this testing ground for his idea, his hypothesis that this was a better solution, a less costly solution, and there it is. Okay, so now I'm gonna go away to the other side of digital inclusion. The, the lab was, you know, as I said, it was our belief that all of this new technology was changing manufacturing, it was changing education, it was changing all of these things. Um, in the world, and that many people in Chicago didn't have access to those tools, to those really high-tech tools that are coming out and changing everything. And so we felt like it was our responsibility to make them accessible. On the very other side of the spectrum, um, the folks that I talked about earlier that come in and use our public computers, the three million sessions last year, typically those are people who don't have any other way to get online or use computers. This is another map of the city of Chicago. Um, as I said earlier, it's like, oh, it's hard to read, but the, the deal is the red is our places where um, less than 54% of households have broadband at home. Um, and then, you know, the orange, it's less than 63%, and et cetera. Um, the national average in the U.S., I think, is something like 80%. So we're pretty far uh, in many of these neighborhoods behind the national average for broadband at home. And broadband at home, you know, if you just take a m moment to think about it um, can be a proxy for so many other things. And this map, for example, all the red here could very easily be highest crime, highest poverty, you know, highest unemployment in the city of Chicago. Because, um, you know, just take a moment and think about how or where you would be if you didn't have this ubiquitous access to the internet that you probably have. I mean, I have all the time. And if you really had to struggle to get online and do all of the things that you do. Think of everything that you do in just a day, you know, using your phone or using your, your computer. And these are folks who just don't, don't have the opportunity to do that. So these three million sessions last year, um, these are folks who come into our neighborhood branches. And we've had a program since the late 90s. And you, you, you'll know it's since the late 90s because of the name. It's called Cyber Navigator. Uh, and uh, we like it now because it's sort of retro. <laughs> Um, and these folks are, uh, we privately fundraise for this position, and it's a part-time person who comes into the library and coaches people on uh, using computers and using the internet. Many of the people who come to use public access computers really have no idea how to use a computer and don't believe that computers are for them, right? They think they're either too old, undereducated, et cetera. They've never had to use a computer for their work life. A lot of folks who work with their hands get their job through informal sector. You know, there's just this whole other world. And so in a lot of these neighborhoods in Chicago, people are just completely left out, right? They're left out of the social stuff that we do on our phones, on our computers, et cetera. They're left out of the, like, online commerce that so many of us depend on in lots of ways. They're left out of, you know, getting information that they need, and they're really left out of jobs. So for us, you know, we started thinking about how we could, as a library system, better support people making connections into the workforce and into the workforce services system and into, you know, all of the things that we know help people um, support their families. And we found, the, you know, the first step 
was really teaching people how to use computers at least at the very basic level. Because you can't apply for a job at McDonald's today without a computer. You can't apply for a job at Walmart without filling out a 30-minute online application. Um, so we, you know, we have public computers available in every one of our branches. We have folks in most of our branches, and we're actually trying really hard this year to fundraise to boost that up to make it every one of our branches, because we think there's need in every neighborhood, even in affluent neighborhoods, right? There are people who, who need this kind of help. And um, we, uh, for the last three years in a row consistently, these cyber navigators, these part-time folks, have, have um, served about 100,000 people a year in Chicago. And uh, these are people, as I said, who, you know, it's hard to get your head around, and that's why I'm kind of slowing down here, is thinking, like, imagine if you had never used a mouse or a touchpad or a keyboard, and suddenly you're unemployed for the first time in 25 years, and people are telling you that the only way to apply for any job is to do it through this machine that has felt totally foreign to you. Um, we see a lot of those people, and there are... Uh, millions of them across the country, um, something like 15% of the U.S. population has never used a computer, of the adult population. Um, and it's surprising. Uh, these folks are members of our community. We want them to be engaged. We want them to participate. We're missing out on their talent if they're not participating. So we've taken very seriously this, this notion that a library can be a place to help. And um, Right now, the cyber navigators are creative folks who on their own are trying to figure out you know, how to help Maria and George and Bob and all of these different individuals in different ways. What we decided to do last year is bring together a cohort of our really cre most creative cyber navigators, about eight of them, with a curriculum specialist and a designer and say, all right, guys, how do we tackle this problem in a more systematic way? Is there a curriculum, online curriculum, that already exists that can help adults from zero to very basic computer proficiency so they can at least fill out an online form, send an email, attach a document, et cetera? Um, we did a big scan far and wide. We found a couple OK tools out there, nothing great. Um, so we're actually, we've, so we've been prototyping these tools and trying to see how people respond to them. Um, and we have some pretty good insights now uh, after a few months of that. And we're in the process now of trying to figure out how we create an interface for one kind of set of curriculum tools that can be facilitated by a coach. In our context, the neat thing is that in Chicago, we've gotten tons of buy-in from other city and nonprofit organizations who have the same problem, right? So the folks who run the workforce centers, um, folks who run community-based organizations are saying, yeah, we have the same problem, right? We're trying to help our community members apply for public benefits, and it's all online. We're trying to help folks sign up for Obamacare, and it's all online. And we really, you know, need a solution. So we, um, you know, back to taking advantage of this asset that the library has of being a trusted community source, resource, and anchor, we've brought all these folks together now over the last several months to tell us their best, you know, their best thinking, their best approach, and we're together with them designing, I think, a better solution that might be um, applicable nationwide, which is really exciting. So this is an example of one of the folks getting a coaching session. <laughs> but as you can see, it's like it's not very efficient, right? It's like one guy and one guy, and 45 minutes later, the guy maybe has opened up an email account and sent a couple emails, and so we're trying to find this kind of blended approach to using technology that's out there that people can interact with um, along with some human intervention because, you know, we all need humans to help encourage us. You know, uh, not surprisingly, some of the insights we have from the prototyping phase is that people need encouragement. They feel really discouraged, um, and they need to understand when they're making progress and what that progress looks like in the grand scheme of things. So all of these things that, you know, aren't rocket science, but that nobody's quite figured out how to do yet. So it's a fun problem and an important problem to tackle. We also decided to dip our toe into providing internet access to folks. So um, last year we entered into the Night News Challenge competition. They put out a challenge to the world to say, how do we make the internet better? 
And we said, we think we make the internet better by inviting more people to get online. And we would like to test an approach to that, which is to lend out Wi-Fi hotspots in libraries through our regular lending system, the way that you would check out a book. Um, you check out a hotspot for three weeks, and you get to be online whenever you want for three weeks. And you, know, you bring it back, and the next person checks it out. We're about to launch that project, actually. It's taken a lot longer than I imagined to do the contract negotiation with the provider. <laughs> um, but we've, we've done a lot of really nice user research in the process. And I think you know, we've gotten a, a, like an understanding of how people might use these things and, and what people might do with them. We're also going to loan out a limited number of um, Chromebooks and uh, Surface kind of tablet things as bundles with these hotspots for people who don't have a device at all. We know that people have, tend to have smartphones, um, but don't have plans, so they're not activated. The smartphone part of it isn't activated. They're using them as phones, mostly. Um, so we think that this might be a good solution to marry with those folks who have smartphones, but no, no plan. Um, and we're really focusing this little pilot um, on three neighborhoods that are really, really red from that map I showed you a while ago, where you know, at home connectivity is under, under 50%. Um, we know that access by itself and really basic skills alone aren't gonna move the needle for our communities. So um, the last uh, sort of idea that we're testing that I'll share with you uh, about today is called uh, peer learning circles. And they're not a new idea, obviously, they're an old idea. <laughs> But the way that we're testing them, they've been tested many different places and times, and often they're too costly, too labor intensive, too much facilitation is needed, et cetera. We're trying to test a model that can be replicated in neighborhood libraries or in anywhere without a whole lot of expense. And we're partnering with an organization called Peer-to-Peer -Peer University, or P2PU. They're spun out of MIT Media Lab. And they've designed a set of online tools and facilitation guides that somebody can use to get people together who are taking an online course and build first and foremost this human bond uh, <laughs> among the group so that the people taking the class have a support system and a, essentially peers that can hold them accountable um, to one another. And uh, we just started testing it actually last week in two of our libraries with four classes. They, are, they span the, the, the kind of um, difficulty range. So a couple of the classes are uh, uh, GED math prep classes that folks decided they really wanted to take together as a cohort. And the facilitation, I think, will allow them to complete at a higher rate and to you know, get more out of the experience. Um, and then the second couple of classes are Python. So they're folks learning Python, and they're doing it in a cohort uh, group to, to help each other out. So we really um, have high hopes for this experiment, and we think that it's a way to bridge this kind of like digital resources that are out there, but the fact that people need human connection to make them meaningful. Um, and that's it. That is all I'm, all I'm here to say is, you know, what, you know, why are libraries important? What I hope that you'll get out of this as designers, as people who are engaged in solutions to problems is that, you know, libraries are important assets, hopefully, and resources to you as users. Um, we are very much committed to this notion of access for all. So if you have a project or an idea that really depends on, you know, the integrity of, of a democratic community, um, libraries might be good partners uh, to engage in those kinds of projects. Um, they have always been and can continue to be, I think, in the digital age, these knowledge and learning hubs where people can exchange ideas in real time, but also use digital assets accompanied by other members of their community to make them meaningful. Um, and that libraries are everywhere. So wherever you live, there's probably a library within a few miles. Um, and if you haven't gotten to know them or whatever, I would just encourage you to, to do so. I am new to the field of libraries. That's not my uh, training or background. And I've been blown away by the commitment, the creativity uh, of librarians and of people in this profession. So thank you. Do we have time for questions?
So I think we have a little bit of time for questions if anybody has a question or a burning comment or anything they'd like to share. Miss, here's a microphone for you. Do you know if Portland has any of these programs? Uh, right Portland now? does have some of these programs. I actually was in a national uh, meeting about libraries as active learning spaces yesterday in Kansas City, and somebody from Multnomah uh, County was there to talk about some of the cool programs that are going on here, especially the, the one I know most about is this digital access, digital skill development program. But I know they've got a lot of really creative stuff bubbling up. Yes? Uh, I'll hold it. You'll hold it, okay. Um, hi, I'm actually with Multnomah County Library and ah. we're, we're launching a makerspace, uh, which we're really excited about. But um, I'd love to hear more about how you're measuring outcomes from your makerspace. That's one of the things. We know if we put a lot of cool mm -hmm. kit in a room, we'll get lots of people coming and using it, but we're really interested in those long-term outcomes, and I wonder how you're measuring that. So we're mostly measuring short-term indicators of long-term outcomes. Um, as I said, what we were hoping to achieve through the makerspace is allowing adults to be creative, do it together, um, and, and understand, begin to understand the universe that making kind of leads to. So what we've done is implemented the survey tool. And we've asked people to tell us at the end of each experiment experience, you know, the, the survey tool was designed by researchers so that it's worded in ways that are, uh, that are credible. And we're just asking them to tell us about their experience and sort of using that together with observations as evidence that you know, we're either achieving or not achieving what we set out to achieve. And, and we, for the most part, we are. And, and what we also use the survey tool for, actually, which I think is even more important, is every week we look at survey results as a team. And the team tweaks and tinkers with the design of the program based on what we're learning and hearing from people, whether they want more of this or less of that. Um, and then we also, uh, then the rest is just anecdotal. The longer term stuff, like I can tell you about people who have gotten jobs because they met someone in the lab and they now go work for the Inventables, the company that makes and sells a bunch of our 3D printing <laughs> materials, or you know, people who have gone into the city colleges system and are now taking manufacturing courses because they realized in our makerspace that manufacturing is now fun and cool and digital. You know, things like that. I think we're good. I think we're good. Okay, thank you everybody.